with another episode of Why Wasn't It Better, everybody's favorite movie podcast. I am your host, Patrick Darms. And I'm your co-host, Anton Paras. And we are getting into our second season now, Anton. Yes, we are. We had our, we had our season two premiere last week where, where we discussed Terminator 3, The Rise of the Machines, with our first guest of the season, Peter Baldeo. No guest this week, but we do have, uh, I believe... Nine guests slated for the remainder yeah, of this we're, season. Uh, we're going to have quite the, you know, quite the panel of folks coming in to talk film. I think that our podcasting is rubbing off on others. Definitely, that's the idea. We want to do this as, as as much as we can. We like the idea of guests. We even debated trying to get a guest for every episode. Some podcasts do that, but that's a lot harder to do than you'd think. Even though. We know enough people that would probably be interested. Getting two people together to record is a feat in of itself. Getting three or more, as we know, is much more of a challenge. Plus, it's uh, always good to come back to the basics. Patrick and Anton, ready to talk about films, just like we did in our inaugural season. That's right. Before we um, get into this week's film, is there anything you want to say about Chris Paul joining the Golden State Warriors. It's it's going to be either exactly what people are expecting or people are going to be surprised. In which case... Which one is the good scenario? <laughs> the surprise? The surprise. Because okay. I think everyone's expecting he's not going to have anything left in the tank. I would agree with that. That's which I'm not a Warriors last... fan, but that's, that's what I'm expecting. Well, seeing last season, he showed... That he's not going to be someone to rely on for the to, to take on heavy minutes throughout the season. He's not going to be the number one option. But on the Warriors, he doesn't have to. He just needs to distribute the ball, keep turnovers down. He has to support Steph Curry, which is so funny that now instead of being on the other side of a rivalry with whether it was Lob City or a- any of the other horrible teams that Chris Paul has been in through the years versus the Warriors, now he's on the Warriors. I really want to read the story of how he found out. Maybe he was on a plane ride or something. And he's like, oh, I'm on the Warriors now. I can see there's some pain on your face. It's just funny. It's just funny, man. It's, oh, like, it's, funny, uh, all right. it's like if Reggie Miller... Played on the Bulls. That's a good comparison. It's like someone yeah. that you knew you just didn't like watching play against your team. No, I never. I yeah, I know what you mean. Regardless, maybe Steve Kerr can make it work. But anyway, enough about that. Right. Enough about that. That's not what the people are here for. No. This week's episode. What are we talking about? We're talking about Incredibles two. Incredibles two, Patrick. Did you choose this or did I? I think you did. This was right? this was me. I'm I'm an animation fan. Uh, I'd love me some Pixar and I felt like this was a really good one to chew through. This is a great pick. I was really excited when we when you decided to pick this one for the second episode. Plenty to talk about here. Beginning immediately after the first film ends, telecommunications moguls Winston and Evelyn Dever enlist Elastigirl to fight crime and make the public fall in love with superheroes once again. That leaves Mr. Incredible with one of his greatest challenges ever, staying home and taking care of three rambunctious children. As Violet, Dash, and Jack-Jack offer him a new set of headaches, a cyber criminal named Screenslaver launches his dastardly plan, hypnotizing the world through computer screens. Incredibles 2 was released on June 25th, 2018 by Walt Disney Studios and Pixar Animation Studios, written and directed by Brad Bird, featuring the voices of Craig T. Nelson, Holly Hunter, Sarah Vow, Huckleberry Milner, Samuel L. Jackson, Bob Odenkirk, Catherine Keener, and Jonathan Banks. Budgeted at $200 million, it generated a box office revenue of $1.24 billion. Huge, wow. huge moneymaker for Pixar and Disney. Anton, Ugh. why have you chosen this movie for this week's episode? Well, first, let me, let's take a step back. One, I love animated films. I love being able to dissect how directors, writers, animators choose to take this medium and 
bring films to the next level. There's a lot of things you can do in animation that you can't necessarily do with live action. So that's always been very interesting to me. Pixar, of course, has a very special place in my heart, along with a lot of folks for the quality that the studio has put out um, throughout the years. And I think that one can look at this film as just a side of Pixar's quality, not being quite as home run-esque as maybe earlier in the studio's run. We'll start, we'll, we'll talk more about that, but I think particularly for this film, it was a, it was one where I was really excited to see this film in theaters and I just absolutely loved the first Incredibles. So I knew that this was one that was going to have to be on the list and one that we'd have to talk about. So here we are today. I love the first Incredibles too. It's actually probably one of my 10 favorite movies ever. It's my favorite mm-hmm. Pixar movie. It's possibly my favorite superhero movie mm, ever too, okay. which is saying a lot because there's a lot of great superhero movies. But it stands it stands above a, a lot of the other Pixar stuff. I like a lot of the Pixar movies as well. Toy Story 1 through 3, mm-hmm. Monsters, Inc., Coco, Finding Nemo. These are all classics to me. And Pixar really can, they continued that tradition with this, with the first Incredibles, which back in 2004, I had forgotten. It was only like their sixth movie. They were, you don't think of the Incredibles as like an early Pixar movie, but it is. And so this sequel, I would say the most highly anticipated sequel that Pixar ever attempted, probably even still to this day. I can't really think of one that people were more excited for. To be fair, I think that uh, sits on the fact that Pixar had done sequels so well. Yeah, yes, previously to this, I think they had. Because up until this point, I think we just had the Toy Stories and the Cars movies, right? Right, right. That were sequels. Cars was probably the first Pixar movie that nobody except little kids really liked. Maybe maybe some adults, but it, it's generally thought of as one of the lesser Pixar efforts. Yeah. But they kept going even into the late 2000s with Ratatouille, Wally, Up, Toy Story 3. They were all pretty much masterpieces. But yeah. but you're right, something flipped around 2010. Maybe it was impossible to maintain that level of success, but for me and a lot of other people, you included, the movies just seemed to lose lose a little bit of that magic. I liked Inside Out, I liked Finding Dory, but the only one that I really consider a masterpiece that they did any any time recently was Coco. Mm. which brings us to this movie Incredibles 2 it was a long wait but 14 years later we finally got the sequel now some people may consider this a strange choice on our part because if you go to internet movie database or Rotten Tomatoes or if you ask any person this is rated really really highly I think it has above a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes yeah like a 93% yeah so anything you want to say on that before we get into the production history We've said it before, we're going to rate films that can be good, like that are good. We're going to we're going to or we're going to look at films that did well at the box office. But the point is there are aspects of this film that could have been better. And we'll touch on things like expectations, sequel comparisons, aspects of the story that we really feel like show us why this could have been a better film. I think that's well said. The production history of this movie. Brad Bird, he followed up The Incredibles with Ratatouille, which came out in 2007. That's my favorite Pixar film. It's a great movie. It really is. Mm -hmm. But during the media interviews for that film, Bird stated that he was open to the idea of a sequel to The Incredibles, but only if it could be better than the original. Kind of a bold statement. He said, quote, I have pieces that I think are good, but I don't have them all together, end quote. Him saying that didn't go anywhere, anywhere, anywhere quickly, because in 2011, he directed Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, which is an awesome movie if you've never seen it. I don't know if you've seen it on Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible is a great series. Yeah. Yeah. Was that the first that included Simon Pegg? No. No. Okay. No, he was in the third one, the J.J. Abrams one. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. But it was the first to feature Simon Pegg as a field agent. He was like a tech guy in the third movie. So, mm. But anyway, fast forward two years later, 2013, Bird said that he was interested 
in the incredible sequel and he was working on story ideas and at the disney shareholder meeting in march of 2014 disney ceo and chairman bob Iger confirmed that pixar was working on an incredible sequel and he also said that bird would return as both the director and the screenwriter and i remember following all this news at the time because that this was a sequel that I was really, really looking forward to it. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody was. We were all wait. We were all wondering, like, when is this going to happen? But Bird delayed the project once again to work on the film Tomorrowland, which was released Ugh. in 2015, and it is one of the biggest box office bombs that Disney has ever suffered. It's that was probably a movie that we will eventually cover on this podcast. Yeah, that was rough. Yeah, it turns out unless it's called Pirates of the Caribbean, it's probably not. A great idea to base a move movie on an amusement park ride. I'm I'd be stoked to see Autopia. It, what is that? It's like the car. There's like the 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 ride where you just drive a car on a track. Oh, that could be like any ride, though, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Well, they have Speed Racer. Is that close enough? Yeah. Fair enough. Another movie we'll probably cover. Underrated, in my opinion, but yeah, I didn't hate it. Yeah. Not a bad movie. It's not good either, but but anyway. Uh, so after Tomorrowland, Bird opened up the possibility of doing another Incredibles movie. One of the challenges that he faced when writing this sequel was how to deal with the large number of superhero films and television series that had been released since the first film, most notably Disney's own Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, Bird wanted to avoid tropes related to the superhero genre, saying, quote, I don't think that kind of idea stays interesting for very long. For me, the interesting thing was never the superhero part of it. It was more the family dynamic and how superhero things play into that, end quote. He did reveal that the story would be focused primarily on Elastigirl. And though the sequel was released 14 years after the first, Brad did not want to use a narrative element like an ellipsis or to come up with new characters, and instead continued from where the first film left off, literally immediately. This allowed him to keep the characters with the same superpowers and not have to develop new ones, nor did he need to figure out how to deal with Violet and Dash being adults. Put a huge pin in that, because I think both of us want to come back to this. Now, while the plot of the 2005 follow-up video game, The Incredibles Rise of the Underminer, begins at the same point in time, Bird chose to discard the game's continuity. Put another pin in that. So Evelyn um, was originally meant to have another brother named Nelson, who was originally going to be the main villain, but the character was cut because the creators would prefer a female villain. So early into production, Evelyn was originally going to be an electric-based supervillain named Shelectric. Um, The idea was scrapped and instead turned into Evelyn. This allowed Nelson to be turned into Helectrix. That's interesting. Note, the voice actress for Evelyn was also in the film Get Out. Interesting. That's right. So almost the entire voice cast was brought back for this, with newcomer Huckleberry Milner replacing Spencer Fox's voice for Dash. Jonathan Banks of uh, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul fame replaced Bud Lucky as the voice of Rick Decker after Lucky retired in 2014. The film is dedicated to Lucky's memory as he passed away shortly before its release, so R.I.P. Instead of this movie being released on June 21st, 2019, Pixar swapped release dates with Toy Story 4 as the film was being completed ahead of schedule while the other was lagging in production, which was initially going to be released on June 15th, 2018. But upon its release, the film broke several box office records, grossing over $1 billion. (laughs) It holds an outstanding 93% Rotten Tomato score, as we've touched on earlier. And yes, We are at quite a film that has just seems to have hit all of the boxes of quite a successful film. But here we are today looking to review this film and cover this film that's held in such high regard. Would you say that this is the most well-regarded movie that we've covered on this podcast so far? I think it's even it's held in even higher regard than The Dark Knight Rises, I think. I think so especially a franchise that's held in very high regard, right? Yeah. So interesting to look at it with a lens. It's a fun lens to look at films that do so well or are critically regarded so well, because even for me, like I love the film Gangs of New York, but just look at what could have made it better. It's very eye opening. So I hope that for listeners today, maybe if they already held this film in such high regard, 
after listening to a few things, maybe they can appreciate what could have been. It's a good way of putting it. I would add to that the same thing, just in a slightly different message, but echoing what you said, which is we're not always going to cover movies that we don't like or that we think are bad. Mm -hmm. I would say just wait until the end when we render our verdicts. Now, why wasn't it better? I think it's safe to say that our reasons for this discussion part of this episode are all story related. Would you agree? Agreed. Plus, you know, plus or minus minor quibbles here and there. Right. Because like, let, let's let maybe let's let's knock something like off the table. Animation was fantastic. Oh, yeah. very well animated film. One of the best animated films I've seen in terms of just the pure yeah. beauty and the and the detail right. in the animation. This is a stunning film to look at to watch yeah especially comparing one and two it, oh, it yeah. really it, it, it looks like two looks gorgeous yeah not that one doesn't look bad but you you can tell how much animation yeah took a quantum leap over that 14 right. years right animation advances there's an and this film benefited from that but like you said there's a lot of things that we can look at in the writing and the storytelling that i think held this film back Definitely. Well, let's get into it. So number one reason why wasn't this better is the lack of a time jump. Mm -hmm. We waited 14 years for the sequel, and yet the story begins immediately after the ending of the first one. I think this was a massive mistake on Brad Bird's part. I think it's lazy storytelling. To yeah, me, it's I think a cop it's, out. It's tough because it's it's easy, right? It's the easy route. Yeah, by avoiding any kind of a time jump, he also avoided having to give the characters any additional arcs or changes of any kind, right? Like, heaven forbid right. we have any kind of further character development. Instead, he decides to make a sequel that picks up straight after the events of the first one. It, it felt pointless to me. The Underminer ending, right? Which concluded mm -hmm. the first film. I don't think it should have been the hook for this sequel. It works much better as an open ending. When, it, when it's basically, at the end of the first one, it's just implying that there's more adventures to come for the Parr family, right? Right. I didn't particularly care about watching that fight develop, but I think it, it diminishes the ending of the first film. If you skip the whole Underminer thing entirely and just let us assume they took care of him, it works better going into this movie's story. Right. I think with that aspect too, just the way then that the Underminer fight carried out in the beginning of the film just it kind of fizzled it, it wasn't as fantastic as one would have hoped after after waiting so long for the sequel yeah and it, and that was also featured of course in that video game I, mean, I didn't play it but i just found that interesting yeah. doing the research that they really had that part of the story already covered most of the major plot points in this movie they could have served i would say as some kind of a prologue before they should have done a time skip to the main story mm -hmm. that probably should have take, took, taken place years later. Do you remember in the first movie, the prologue of it took place 10 to 20 years before the events of the main story, right? When the superheroes right. were in their glory days, before they were outlawed. Right, Syndrome was this still This film a kid. could have used something similar. Or at least, I think like... What we're, what I want to get at in terms of like story setting is a better establishment to really strongly tell a story and really set up for like character arcs for the characters versus this just kind of felt like a lazy and this is where we were. Yeah, you could set it a decade into the future when the supers were already allowed to do the hero work again, like if they got their rights back. You could, yeah. you could have just done a prologue where the government changes the laws and they get their first legal work. Something else, and like not specifically related to this movie story, but one of the things that others have echoed this, I've heard other people echo this opinion. The 14-year mm -hmm. gap, it made things challenging behind the scenes as well, which Bird himself actually realized. A lot had changed since 2004. Back then, superhero movies were few and far between. I was looking, I was looking this up. 2004... There were probably more superhero movies than you remember, but when I list them, it'll make more sense. So that year, in, a, in addition to The Incredibles, we had Spider-Man 2, The Punisher, Hellboy, Catwoman, and Blade Trinity. I would say only this and the Spider-Man sequel were actually successful movies. I think Hellboy did mm -hmm. okay, but I wouldn't call that a super successful superhero movie. Right. 
fast forward to 2018 when this sequel comes out, superhero movies are a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. There's TV shows. The MCU is is like this was like what was this the year before Endgame and Infinity War? I mean, this was like it was the the landscape was just so different by that point. The first film was like an interesting satire of superheroes, like the way it bemused monologues and capes and such. It, it really felt fresh in 2004. There's there was nothing else like it at the time. Right. By 2018, I don't know, superhero movies, they were just everywhere. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I think that we'll touch more on this, but in terms of instead of being able trying instead of being able to tackle some of the established tropes. It just tackled the same ones, yeah. and that yeah. didn't oh. really make for great storytelling, right? Yeah, you mean like superheroes being illegal? Yeah, it's been there, done that. Yeah, it had been done to death by 2018. Like we, we had already seen Watchmen, we had already seen the X-Men movies, and Civil War had already been, what, two years before this? Captain America Civil War? Right, right. So yeah, this this movie just did not feel as fresh to me. And I mentioned this to you, I think, before we recorded. Mm -hmm. I would probably feel differently about this movie story if it had been released, let's say, two or three years after the first. Interesting. Like, I think that there's definitely, in hindsight, it would have been different because there also isn't the same. There isn't the same perception of superhero films in 20 in in that same time span as there would have been after like such a long gap with the film releasing in 2018. So like a lot of the interpretation still would have felt fresh. Maybe the expectations were just too high, but the innovation that you got in the first one, you don't get it here. No. Back to that Brad Bird quote about saying something years ago about how a sequel would only work or he would only, he would only make a sequel if he found a story that needs to be told all the points that we, we've just been bringing up, they really, they reinforced the idea that this was just a cash grab. The story, which we're going to get into in the next reason, the actual plot, it right. was decent enough for like an obligatory sequel, but it doesn't feel necessary to me. Yeah, it's just, it feels so funny to think that Brad Bird talked about only doing one if it felt like a story that needed to be told, but what we ended up getting was a story that was retold. Yes. Now, the actual plot, I did not catch this until the last rewatch because it happens so quickly, it's, it's real easy to miss. It happens near the beginning of the movie. Any of the listeners have caught this, but if you haven't, pay attention for this. This movie's entire plot gets triggered by Winston Dever randomly seeing the Parra family in action against the Underminer in the prologue. Mm-hmm. So this whole, thing gets, this whole thing gets set in motion by a random occurrence if Winston hadn't seen them and decided, oh, cool, the superheroes are back, like it's time to launch my new PR campaign, what would his sister Evelyn have done? Like, was she planning the screen slaver thing before that? Because it seemed like she was. It seemed like she put a lot of thought into that. Like, did she need Elastigirl to make that plan work? Because none the- of this happens if her brother just doesn't happen to randomly see them in the beginning. Yeah, and everything that Evelyn agreed to go along with as part of her master plan actually ends up putting supers back in the forefront and does less to under does less to undermine at the end of the day. Also, I want to call this out. Screen slaver is such a bad villain name, especially for 2018. And they yes. had her name's Evelyn Dever, right? Not very subtle. Well, but why not just yeah why not just go for endeavor like that that would have been fun and they're like oh i get it it's her name <laughs> that could have been fun it could have been i mean i'm not trying to like pitch story ideas but i just wanted to point out you screen slaver is a very stupid name <laughs> you can pitch away i'm sure disney is dying for an excuse to make incredible story all i'm saying time skip embrace the tropes just embrace them because sometimes Look, it's embracing I, them when you get to see the real hilarity of it all. <laughs> Another point about the plot. So when Elastigirl meets the ambassador, right? This is before she goes on mm-hmm. that talk show. At this point, the superheroes are still illegal. And this is like a government official, right? So at this point, mm-hmm. I don't think this is a small nit to pick. At this point, Elastigirl is in public openly breaking the law, right? Why isn't she arrested? 
Now, you could make the case that the family only gets scolded by the government agents in the beginning, even though they mess up all the stuff when they're trying to stop the underminer, right? They only really get like a slap on the, maybe not even a slap on the wrist, right? We never actually right. see any legal consequences for their actions. No, but just the consequence of like pulled funding for the program. Yeah. Which probably in itself is like, well, this is what happens. Like there's still protections in place because heroes have done things for society historically. And maybe that's the pass they get. But at the end of the day, like maybe they just don't like there, there isn't enough to actually arrest them. Number two, you mentioned this, that the story was retold. It wasn't just retold. It's a retread of the first movie. Hmm. Completely. It, it's lazy. Yes. This is related to the lack of the time jump. At a very high level, my biggest gripe with this is that if you've seen the first movie, you've pretty much already seen this movie, right? right. There's not much difference in the plot. Now, a lot of sequels have done this. I'm thinking like famously like Ghostbusters 2 and like Men in Black 2, or it's just they took the same thing from the first movie and they just recycled it. Right. It's good. Quick money. Quick 1.2 billion. But the, I mean, this is like when you're thinking about like sequels, especially Pixar, which is held in, I would say, just a much higher regard than a lot of other movie studios, just because they had such a high batting average for so long. But this is the safest, most conservative, most milk toast sequel ever that they've put out. Ultimate cash grab. There's no new ideas here. No innovation. Really no. nothing original. It's just a rehash of the first movie. You can tell Brad Bird only made this because of pressure from Disney. And I don't know about the passion here. Like after 14 years, this is the only story that he could come up with. And I have complete doubts that this is the best that they could do, right? Especially for Brad Bird, someone that's put out a couple of the best animated films like ever. I mean, not even just counting the original Incredibles, but I loved the Iron Giant. You're telling me that yeah, in the day and age of like even more advanced animation, the what seems to be a passion for storytelling that the best option was just to do the same story but have Elastigirl be the focus. It just doesn't really make sense. No, I, I mean, it's so similar to the first one. And it's not even just the 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 um, Elastigirl and Mr. Incredible switch, right? It's everything else. It's supers are trying to return to society. Right. It's the family trying to figure out how to function while also dealing with their powers. It's one parent going off and getting involved in some villainous scheme. And then the other members of the family have to come and save them. The villain is made mostly the same villain, too. There's not much difference between Evelyn Dever and Syndrome. Right. And, you know, and this, this, this normal person who's, who's bitter, they, mm -hmm. they, they, you think that they're an ally until they're not. But they blame supers for their problems. Yeah. They're using technology for their plan because they don't have powers of their own. Very, it felt very much like an inferior copy. Now, there were aspects that I loved. And funny enough, a lot of those were the ones more grounded in reality. Like I loved any of the scenes where it was the family dialogue. The dialogue yes. I thought was just fantastic. And I feel like that's Absolutely. where it was really laying into the more grounded aspects of the storytelling and the themes of, around family. Those, that's, that's what was interesting. That You're definitely right. That was interesting. Even though they do the, the switch, right? Mr. Incredible, he still wants to be the hero, though. He takes his family for granted. Mm -hmm. He has to learn that they're valuable to him. They get together and there's bonding. It's very entertaining stuff. But think about it like this. The roles are reversed and it's still about his struggle to accept his role in the family. That's what it all is. That's what, It's the same damn movie. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no like he doesn't have that I'm not strong enough moment. But I don't know. Felt just it felt exactly the same. I I agree with you completely. And I feel like it's what. Once you've already seen that story be told, once you've already, especially looking at it from the lens of an adult watching The Incredibles, they were able to tell very personal stories and personal themes that really uh, everyone relates to. The importance of family, um, self-worth, identity. But then this film is just those same 
same themes and at the same time while those are important themes i don't think that they're explored in a way that's novel that really demands attention from the audience these are still really great characters but if we're just exploring the same thing or if we're not even exploring them if we're just showing the same thing that's not very interesting for viewers and it really showed completely agree so the switch that Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl do, right? If this felt familiar from the first Incredibles, it should feel familiar yeah. <laughs> with other Pixar movies as well. This was the fourth time that this happened in a Pixar movie where the, pro- where the protagonist and like a co-protagonist switch roles. So we get this one. The other time this happened was in Cars 2 when Mater took over from Lightning McQueen. It happened mm-hmm. in Monsters University when Mike took over from Sully. And it happened again in Finding Dory, where Dory takes over for Marlin. Right. And I'd argue that the the switch, it's not necessarily a bad decision because sometimes there's opportunities where there's a character that we want to explore more. I feel like that was really well done in Finding Dory because it was a character that was really quirky in the first one, but we really didn't understand the emotional depth or story behind Dory's character. And then you watch Finding Dory and you turn into a blubbering mess because you realize how sad of a backstory she actually has. And it has such emotional depth of a film. But there wasn't really anything to explore in an interesting way for this film. So that's where the parallels, I really feel like, um, separated. That's a good point about Finding Dory. You don't get that kind of emotional depth here, though. No. No. Even some of the action was a retread from the first movie. Did you notice this? Like when we oh, just the, the way they use their powers to yeah yeah. Like when we see Elastigirl stop a train from crashing, like we already saw that in the first movie, in the prologue when Mister Incredible stops mm-hmm. it. Even the big final, the, the the climactic action sequ- sequence on the yacht, mm-hmm. that was just a repeat to me of the opening scene. They're trying to stop this big gigantic thing from ruining the city, right? Mm -hmm. The point I'm making, this movie works a lot better if the first one doesn't already exist. We already knew the characters. We already knew their lives. We already went through the the family, especially the kids, like discovering their identities as superheroes. But then they just rewrote Elastigirl and they kind of, it felt like they just ignored most of what happened from the first one and tried to rehash that story. Right. There was already so much established and in character development wise, that was great for the characters in the first one that it was kind of felt thrown out the window once the second one came along. Now, I don't know how much truth there is to this. So take this with a grain of salt. But I have read online in a couple different places oh, that Brad man. Bird, this is good. Brad Bird came up with an idea that he really liked initially, and it had to do with artificial intelligence. And they started production with that story idea. But then partway through, Bird realized there was something in the story that didn't work. Now, he didn't reveal what it was in case they ended up coming up with a solution that he could use in the future. But the point is, according to this rumor, they had to rebuild the story from the ground up with less time than usual. So Mm -hmm. if that is true, that would probably explain the lazy writing that we see here where they just ended up recycling and reusing the plot from the first film. Well, I mean, it's not a bad, it's not, if it's true, I reckon that's what happens when your director is forced to make a guaranteed sequel after their previous movie flopped. So it's a film that will probably end up or maybe we'll end up uh, reviewing, but a force awakens. To me, right? Storyline wise, plot wise, it's basically a new hope, right? And yeah, all, yeah, completely straight jacked. Right. And it's that same formula where it's an inferior version, but the effects are better. It looks like, yeah, it's just a more um, souped up version. That's been prettied up a bit, but it's essentially the same film. And I feel like the formula works. People watch it. They really do. They want to see their characters again, but it's nothing that's necessarily interesting. It's just the same 
exact thing. Conversely, what you're saying is the exact reason why I will always go to bat for a sequel like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Now, that's 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 not the most divisive indie movie, but that's one of them, right? Right. And it has flaws. I acknowledge them. But I will always appreciate how different Spielberg and Lucas tried to make mm-hmm. it from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right. I would have appreciated and- something similar here. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's a really good call out where it's okay to be brave and okay to deviate when there's a story to tell. And maybe studios will say, but we made over a billion dollars. What could we have done better? Right. But who knows? Maybe if they tell an even better story, it could have been $2 billion. You never know. I mean, this is the exact same problem that befell the last film we just covered, Terminator 3. We'll get into that a little bit more. I want to talk about the villain in this movie, right. Evelyn Dever. Once again, just like the last movie, It's someone who seeks revenge on superheroes because they feel wronged by them in the past. Her motivation is a little bit different than Syndrome's, Mm -hmm. but she is little more than just a twist on Syndrome. Someone offers our heroes a job. They turn out to be the bad guy. Now, you mentioned how dumb the screen slaver name is. Mm -hmm. What made it even more disappointing to me is the concept of that villain I I felt was pretty cool. The taking right. over people's minds with the with the the radio TV signals and the goggles, mm-hmm. that's all cool stuff. You, you get you, you got a lot of like um, Zodiac Seven vibes from it. Yeah, yeah, it was a cool vibe. That was actually a pretty interesting aspect. Yeah, except that he's not the real villain. Now, the first movie I think does the the villain reveal in a much more clever way. They reveal Syndrome as the villain around somewhere around the halfway point of that movie. And there's a really cool action scene. It's the first scene where, or sorry, it's the second scene, I think, where Bob gets ambushed by the killer robot thing. The robot thing, yeah. Yes. And it's not just a, a, tw- a twist where the villain's explaining themselves, but I don't think Evelyn Devers' motivation makes a lot of sense. Now, her whole motivation, right, her, her whole mantra is that people who depend on others to solve their problems are weak. So she wants to destroy those who are stronger, in this case, superheroes, so that no one can depend on them, right? Right. But her entire motivation is fueled by how her father was killed. But her father was killed because superheroes were outlawed, right? It's like, yeah, he maybe could have gone in the panic room, but he chose to... But it's like if superheroes weren't outlawed, they probably would have came and saved him. Maybe. Should have put the phones in the panic room. Just like in the movie Panic Room, remember? The phone wasn't hooked up, and they had to... Right. Jodie Foster had to run out in slow motion and get the cell phone in a very dramatic fashion. Right, exactly. (laughs) Oh, shouts out to that film. That's a movie I feel like we could cover. Some people don't like it, but it's a pretty awesome movie. That'd be fun. Or I guess guess people do like Panic Room. I don't know. No, people, people do like it. It's just, I don't think it has, like... It doesn't have like huge staying power, but I thought always thought it was a fun, quirky film. Hot take. It's a better movie than Fight Club. All right, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on after that bomb. Yeah, um, anyway. Um, am I kidding? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so <laughs> the Devers parents are father that gets killed. How is that the fault of the Supers? It's not. It's, it's not. a pretty flimsy motive. It requires some serious suspension of disbelief. This particular tra- tragedy made her so bent against supers that she enacted this whole plan. I, I realize we're getting into real deep motivations of a Pixar character, but mm-hmm. I don't know. A lot of Pixar movies have actually really good villains. I don't think it's too much to ask for to ask for a, a, a villain with a better motivation than just a carbon copy of the first one. That's not it's not too much to ask for because a good villain can help define a great hero. Absolutely. It's like how bad the Joker is shows how like how good the ba- Batman can be, right? So if you have a poor yeah. villain, how does that really stand up to what how far a hero is willing to go to defeat them? Doesn't. But this is a classic Pixar trope, right? Some Pixar movies have great villains, but this was just lazy on their part because Evelyn Dever, she's the sixth character 
in a Pixar movie to be to be revealed as the antagonist in a, in a plot twist, mm-hmm. where she you know the character doesn't seem like a villain for a majority of the movie until their true colors are shown during the climax. She's also the third female character in an animated Disney movie to be revealed like this. Just thought I'd throw that in there. But lack of a good plot, lack of a good villain. Someone offers the hero a job, turns out to be the bad guy. They just switched the two roles, Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl. Anton, you're just shaking your head. It could have been way better. It's just like they're so like, sure, it's it's hard. It's definitely hard to be able to tell a fresh story after you feel like so many of the same stories have been told. But what story hasn't been told has been the continuation of the incredible story of that family. And it just feels unfortunate that there couldn't have been a continuation of that story because that would have been what would have been interesting. If there was a fear of rehashing the same tropes, it's well, well, sometimes being able to look at what's been established initially and then maybe even satirizing those tropes, maybe that could have been more interesting. But at the same time, what we did get was the reality of the same film that it still was enjoyable. Like I still liked watching the film, but. Oh, yeah. It just wasn't yeah. that interesting. Number three reason, just our general thoughts on the production. There's going to be a lot of stuff that we like here now. What did we like? Right. I, oh, I loved man. the score by Michael Giacchino. Oh, such, so, oh, such, such music to my ears. <laughs> this and the first one are some of my favorite scores from the 21st century. There's mm-hmm. a ton of John Barry references, a lot of little James Bond references. I love it. And we already talked about the animation. Right. Right. It really is outstanding. It's beautiful looking film. Yeah. If nothing else, this is some of the most impressive animation I've ever seen in a movie. And like that alone would make it worth watching again. Right. Looked very smooth. The facial expressions were just very lifelike and in a fun, but in a fun cartoony way. Yeah. I loved how they animate all the characters. I couldn't find any evidence to confirm this, but the way Winston Dever is animated, he's he's voiced mm-hmm. by, uh, what's his name? Saul Goodman. Better Call Saul. Yeah. He's animated like a character from a George Bellows painting. If you're not familiar with George Bellows, mm-hmm. look him up. He was a pretty famous American artist in the early 20th, 20th century, but very cool. Nonetheless, in addition to the animation, the action in this movie is phenomenal, just like the first one. The set pieces, they're wonderful to watch. They really are. Even if a couple of them maybe feel familiar, but Bird and the animation team really put a lot of thought into the spatial geography mm-hmm. of all of the action. And this is something that I think you might have mentioned this earlier when we were introing the movie, how much more animation can do for action than like a live action movie. Right. This movie takes full advantage of of it being animated. The, the action is just really, really cool to watch. That like in in it's made in such a way that you can tell if they ever tried to do it live action, it would be impossible. I would yeah, say, yeah I would say impossible. All the Elastigirl yeah. stuff, it would not look convincing, even with really, really good CGI. Yeah, and it's why the medium's so fun. It's you can take something that literally is impossible, like the phys- or the physics is impossible, or the budget to do this would be stupid. But you see what you're seeing, and w- but you see with your eyes the scene that's displaying, and you're like, "This looks amazing," and you just forget for a second that it's animated. That's why I'm really nervous about you know Netflix is bringing this Avatar: Last Airbender back to the live action <laughs> format and i'm just really nervous because just like with m night Shyamalan's edition or his previous oh. you know his, his attempt another movie we're going to cover and just like uh the dragon ball z live action movie you're it's doing it in live action completely defeats the purpose of it it's animated for a reason yeah i mean the, these are actually some good films that we'll probably bring up during the death note discussion yes and for sure like there is such a like there there is a big argument whether you can if you can if it's even possible to adapt anime into live action or even animated things into live action can can someone do it properly and i think like i'll save it but i think like arguably yes there are ways to do it there are some examples i have but we'll wait (laughs) 
Um, but in the context in the context of this film and things that we enjoy spe- specifically to um, Incredibles two, yes, you just they were able to make the world seem believable in in what and how fantastic it was. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that discussion. By the way, but <laughs> back to this movie. Yeah, I mean, like Elastigirl on the bike chasing the hover train, mm-hmm. thrilling, absolutely thrilling to watch. Even though it was reminded me of the first movie. But they tell you, I mentioned the spatial geography, right? They tell you how fast mm-hmm. the train is going. They tell you how long the track is. You have a really good sense of geography in terms of where she is, where the train is, where it's going. Same deal when she's going after the helicopters to save the ambassador. Mm-hmm. And then when she goes on the hunt, actually looking for the screen slaver to like pinpoint him. And he's in that like that dark, small apartment building. It's like under the overpass. Right. It's all like, it's all so well done. Mm-hmm. Even the boat, the, the climax on the yacht. Right. It's well executed. Yeah, it, it, it's just very, the pacing, the timing, the action. It was, it was very well put out. I think it's generally well paced, but I did notice it is the longest Pixar film ever at 118 minutes. That's a good call. Yeah, it is long. It's about 15 minutes longer than the first one. I'd say... You could trim 10 minutes out of this. I think it would be better. The climax on the Mm. yacht is almost 20 minutes long. I think it drags a little bit. One thing I think they could have sped up that would have improved the pacing is it takes the characters a while to figure out the goggles thing, how anyone wearing the goggles is being controlled. It It just takes them a while on the yacht to figure it out. It's like you could have just sped that up. Well, part of it, I think, is trying to figure out what story to tell to keep the movie interesting. If you're focusing a lot on the Elastigirl storyline, which includes like investigating into the whole screen slaver storyline, you also, if you only invest in that, you take away from the home life that's like, you know, Mr. Incredible and the rest of the family and like what's going on back at home. So either you take out one or the other, or you have to reduce to, you have, you have to reduce from both. So I feel like they were just like, oh, we'll just keep it in. That's a good point. The, the the home front stuff it really is funny oh amazing the dialogue at home all of that stuff yeah. just great that's where brad bird shines absolutely i don't know if it's as funny as the first one but there's still excellent com- oh. excellent comedy here right all this all the scenes with bob trying to be the stay-at-home dad really are mm-hmm. hilarious craig t nelson has a great understanding of comedic timing i think he's the perfect choice for mr incredible yeah I, I'm I'm not surprised to just how well Brad Bird knows how to direct comedy. He was on The Simpsons during its like golden age. So right, right, yeah. Oh. Curiously though, I would say the most famous stuff from this movie that a lot of people find funny is mm-hmm. stuff that I find the least funny. I see the Jack Jack stuff. I think it's okay. only for me. It's only partially successful. I felt like they overused him. I felt like he had too many powers to the point where it felt like a cheat code. Mm -hmm. The raccoon fight scene, it's funny. I'm not going to dispute that. But it has a slapstick quality to it that nothing I remember in the first film ever resorted to. Yeah, it's um, what was fun, I felt like, in the first one was when it finally reveals that the baby has powers that it was such a gem and like, it was just so hilarious. And then there was the animated short where you actually see Jack, Jack use his powers to just torment uh, the, the babysitter. Uh, Yes. That was also fun in itself. But once you get a lot of it, it doesn't feel new anymore. And it just feels like, Oh yeah, that's just the baby doing its thing. There's nothing surprising anymore about it. And the surprising part was one part of the, was a big part of the fun. So you liked it more than me. I think the Jack, Jack stuff. I enjoyed it, but I do agree with the aspect of like they kind of leaned on it a lot. I will say part of that to me just seems like, I don't know, what are they going to do? They want they want to probably merchandise off of Jack Jack more. Oh, of course. That's why I mean, it's even more curious to me that they didn't bring back any. They didn't introduce any new major characters. You'd think Disney would have been telling bird like real subtly like you know like frozone's wife could be a pretty cool superhero if you want to include her 
and then we'll sell Frozone wife dolls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that rumor that we heard about the original story idea being scrapped and them scrambling to come up with this one, maybe that's the reason. But who, yeah, who knows? Maybe. I found a nice kind of lengthy quote about this movie in a review mm -hmm. written on Screen Rant by Bob Chipman. Quote, it's also worth asking if one is considering what went wrong with Incredibles 2, whether it was ever possible for a sequel to be this specific. Pixar classic to actually go right. Not everything is built to be a franchise, and the universe of The Incredibles indeed feels grounded more in matching familiar references to superhero slash comic Euphemia to the allegorical points the story was making than any other kind of functional long-term continuity. The world of the original film is fairly small in scope, centered on a handful of characters and only gesturing at implications of a wider world, mainly suggested by how similar the less fleshed out parts are to other more familiar superhero tropes. How did the band work globally? Do all the supers have powers or, if, or, or are any of them like Batman? Where do their powers come from? And why are they all seemingly randomly different? All of the similarly named super-powered villains went where exactly? Those are questions demanded of a film that's looking to set up a franchise like Disney's own Marvel Cinematic Universe. But The Incredibles could largely ignore them because its characters and plot points weren't created in service of world building. They were created to act out an allegory for societal resentment of exceptionalism. End quote. That's a pretty lengthy quote. But I really liked it, and it sums yeah. up some of my feelings about this movie's story. Yeah, very well put. That's it for our reasons. Do you have anything to add? I'm putting it out there. I'm not convinced that this was the best story that they could put out. I'm disappointed, or I, yeah, I was, I was disappointed. I still am disappointed. I hope that if a three does come out, which I'm sure there's a list somewhere that says three is going to come out someday, that they can really explore this world a bit more. They can really explore the characters a bit more. And it's just not a rehash of one and two. So we're, we're, we're talking about now. Did we like it? All right. Um, do you, you were kind of getting into that there. Do you want to keep going or do you want me to go? Oh yeah. Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll finish it out. Um, okay. Yeah. It's, I enjoy animation. I enjoy watching what people can do in the medium. And Part of that is just the way that you can uniquely tell stories in animation that you can't do in live action. And so it's disappointing when there's not an interesting story to tell, or if there is an interesting story to tell, but it's not being told. And especially from a studio like Pixar um, and a lot of the names attached, it's just very disappointing for me to, to not see a, a, a braver film or a film that really stood out just because there are so many hits and so many great stories that were told throughout the studio's history. So I thought Incredibles two could have been better, but it wasn't a bad film. It was still fun. There was still a lot of on probably on purpose, a lot of the fun aspects that made me really enjoy the first one. So I give this film a B that's very favorable considering all the negative things that we just spent an hour going over. Right. Very. And I feel like it was probably a microscope on like the worst aspects of the film. Oh, for sure. That's a good way to put it. A microscope. Yeah. Now, if you zoom out this microscope, <laughs> did I like it? Well, this is a challenging film to rate for me. It all starts with the question for me. Did the first film actually need a sequel you could realistically ask that question about any movie but my take on it is this this applies to all sequels if you finish a movie and automatically want to see more from the same characters and or story then a sequel is justified i absolutely wanted a sequel to the first film i was so hyped up for this movie it brings back so much from the original the same director largely the same cast the same characters, even the same conflict. For me, that's precisely the problem. It just doesn't do anything remotely original or new. What do you want from a sequel to a beloved film? That's the fundamental question, right? 
I'm ultimately a story guy. I want the story, or in this case, the character's arcs, to be continued in some form with some kind of new element. It doesn't have to be a different genre, like, say, Alien being followed by Aliens, but I just wanted something different. This is why I mentioned Temple of Doom earlier. I wanted the Parr family saga to be moved forward in some kind of a new, different direction, enhanced in some way. This film does not offer that to me at all. Picks up things right where they left off, puts the family through pretty much the exact same predicament. Now, that being said, I do acknowledge that it is not a movie's job to satisfy all of my expectations. I understand, I, I understand that. This is the same fundamental problem that I had, that you had, and that our guest had with Terminator 3. We waited a very long time for something that ended up being nothing more than just a rehash of its predecessor. You also mentioned Force Awakens, same thing. Narratively, Incredibles 2 is the same disappointment to me. Now, the difference, the major difference between this film and Terminator 3 is this is actually a good movie. This is far more entertaining. This is far better executed. Terminator 3 was an abject failure. This is not close to that. This is not even in the same ballpark. Incredibles 2 is a very quality film. I I actually like this film. Do I think the story that we got was worth the 14-year wait? No. But I am grateful that the sequel happened. I wanted it, and Brad Bird did not crash the plane when he was landing this. I rate this a B-. minus. I think this is a good movie. Maybe it was impossible for this to live up to the hype of the first one. I don't know. The first one was so great, maybe the bar was set too high. But this movie falls into the category of what I call good movie, bad sequel. I mentioned this category when we covered The Dark Knight Rises. I feel the same way about a lot of sequels, like stuff like Born Ultimatum, Finding Dory, Toy Story 4, Monsters University. They're good movies in their own right. Are they great sequels? I'm not sure about that. One thing I want to add. This is a fairly typical Disney sequel, if you think about it. It's derivative. It's the safest route possible, trying to recapture what made the predecessor work. Think about all the Disney movies that we got in the 90s that were direct-to-video, like Aladdin 2, Lion King 2, Mulan 2. Mm -hmm. Those those might have been all direct-to-video. Somewhere along the line, Disney realized that you could release these in the theaters and probably make more money. And that's how we ended up with Cars 2, Cars 3, Monsters University, this, Toy Story 4, Finding Dory. This is the same. Disney's been doing this for a long time. So this really shouldn't surprise anyone. And I don't know if you read this already, Anton. We're apparently getting Inside Out 2, which is a sequel that no one asked for. No, but I mean, I feel like I'm, I'd, I'll am i still watch it. And just because no one asked for it doesn't mean maybe there's a story to tell. That's a good point. As long as, long as, and I hope for it, as long as it's a good story. It's just something like this shows that there wasn't a good story to tell, but it still made money. And in that same way, like Inside Out 2 is probably going to make really good money. I would think so. In theaters right now is uh, the live action Little Mermaid. I have a very love-hate relationship with the live action Disney films right now. I don't think think that. I I think a lot of people feel the same. Yeah. I don't think that the Little Mermaid film was horrible. I don't think that it was exceptional. But I, I'm just looking up right now how much has it made in the box office, and I'm sure that it's enough that it's continue like it gives Disney enough to say, yeah, we're gonna keep doing this, which is the same story, but we're gonna make a few things different. And it's gonna be live action. But they didn't even bother trying to make a sequel. They were like, no, we're just going to remake this same movie shot for shot. Like, I would have respected Force Awakens more mm-hmm. if Disney had just blatantly said, we are remaking A New Hope. Right. Accept it. Right. Like, I, it would have, <laughs> I would have respected it more. What did it end up making at the box office, The Little Mermaid? So, right now, it's looking like it's like $260 million right now. And that's just domestic. How much? Worldwide, worldwide, almost five hundred million dollars. What was the budget? And that's what I'm curious about. I wonder if the budget yeah. was under a hundred million. I don't think so. Like all if that it was stuff more, had, that's that's bad. No, no, all that stuff has high budgets. Like The Lion King was like a two hundred million dollar movie. Beauty and the Ooh, Beast, okay, two hundred no, million. So the the budget was two hundred fifty million. Okay, so five hundred. That's not great. It's not great. It's not great. Is that enough to tell the studio like we, no. we got to tweak things? 
Yeah, no, that's that's not enough for them. If you're talking yeah. a budget of two fifty, you need at least seven fifty, eight hundred to, to where the studio is happy. Right. There's just not enough return, but it's still in theaters and people are still going out to see it. And I think there's definitely still marketing for it. So fair enough. So Anton, is there anything you want to add before we wrap up this week's episode? I'm ready for the next one. Oh, the next one's going to be interesting because we mentioned Indiana Jones earlier in this podcast. The new Indiana Jones is being released in less than a week. Yes. And that is our next movie. Here we our go. Our plan is I'm to excited. see it over the weekend and render our initial verdict for our next episode. Maybe we'll love it. I'm, ex- I'm, I'm excited. I'm hoping for a Tron legacy situation where my expectations are so low that it manages to exceed them. I'm personally very excited. I really like Harrison Ford, like modern Harrison Ford, and I'm I'm ready for a good time of Indiana Jones and having my uh, bucket of popcorn. I'm looking forward to the experience because I don't know anything about the movie. I haven't seen the full trailer, I don't think. Okay. I don't know anything about the plot. I have no idea what a dial of destiny is. But we'll we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. This could be a short episode. It could be a long one. Either way, I believe we will have some things to discuss. So that is what we want to make some bets. We can what in terms of is it going to be good or not? Or over under is Shia LaBeouf going to be in it? I don't think he's in it. Surprise cameo. (laughs) Maybe. I don't know. I don't think he is. The only things Mm. I know about it are. Obviously, Steven Spielberg did not direct it, and George Lucas has no participation in it at all. That could be a good it's thing. Big. Yeah. After the Crystal Skull incident, I I, <laughs> I think the absence of George Lucas may be at welcome. The Crystal thing. Skull affair. Yeah. Oh, I have a hot take for you. I don't hate that movie. Okay. I don't think it's very I'm, good. That, that shocks me. Uh, I don't like it, but I don't hate it like a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. It's another movie where we will absolutely be covering at some point. Okay. Well, listeners, get excited. We're doing another film that's in theaters. And that's right. That's a, that's a wrap on Incredibles 2. We will see you next week when we talk about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Death.